Chapter 9 Principle Number 3, Curiosity Paid the Cat Curiosity is the very basis of education and if you tell me that curiosity killed the cat, I say only that the cat died nobly. Arnold Edinburgh Concept While you're talking to Jack, be curious and ask good questions. Take care to remember key information about his occupation. Then use the collected information in future conversations with both Jack and future prospects. What's in a name? No doubt, you've heard that curiosity killed the cat. When it comes to prospecting, just the opposite is true. In this industry, controlled curiosity can cause copious cash to accumulate in your accounts. Description Being curious and asking the right questions can pay huge dividends in both the long term and the short term. Gathering useful information is the essence of curiosity paid the cat. To form or not to form. You may be familiar with the form model of conversation. Form is an acronym. Family. Occupation. Recreation. Message. The form model of conversation suggests that the elements of family, occupation, recreation, and message are a logical progression of conversation. The thought being that, if asked, a person is generally willing to talk about his family. From there, additional questions can lead the conversation to his occupation and eventually to what he likes to do for fun, recreation. At this point in the conversation, you have discussed three subjects that he is comfortable with. So, the two of you should be relating well. In essence, you have primed the person to receive your message, which was your ultimate goal all along. Form is okay when you're prospecting stationary targets over the course of several encounters, but it takes too much time to be useful with moving targets. The principles of prospecting still apply even when you use form. The two are not mutually exclusive. Waste no time. When you're prospecting a moving target, you have to be able to engage the prospect, relate to the prospect, gather information from the prospect, and make an offer to the prospect all in the span of one to two minutes. You don't have time to learn his life history. You need a small number of questions that get the information you need. The most useful information you can gather from the prospect is about his occupation. There are three questions in particular that pay the cat. As you study the questions below, keep in mind that by the time you ask them, you've already made a positive first impression with 100% chance of sunshine, Chapter 8. Show a little finesse. You don't want Jack to feel interrogated. You're participating in a conversation, not presiding over an inquisition. Question 1, work around here? Ask this question in an ultra-casual tone, as if it were small talk with no particular purpose. As you speak, put the emphasis on the word work. This question may not be grammatically correct. Don't sweat it. If you were concerned about proper grammar, you would ask, do you work nearby? You're not interested in correct grammar. What you want is results. By omitting the words to you, the question is less direct and thus less threatening. It also projects a more casual style of conversation. Think about how you would ask about the weather, example, think it's gonna rain? This question is non-threatening, and the prospect will generally answer it with no resistance. You don't care if he says yes or no, you just want an answer. Set his frame of mind. One purpose of this question is to cause the prospect to think about his occupation. Forcing the prospect into a work frame of mind will prepare him for the second question. Set a precedent. The second purpose behind this question is to set a crucial precedent in the conversation. You ask a question, the prospect answers. You will rely on this precedent throughout the conversation. With the question, work around here? You have entered the body of the conversation funnel, see put a funnel in his ear, chapter 7. Set the appointment. The final purpose behind this question is that the answer may come in handy setting an appointment as part of the follow-up. Ultimately, when a prospect accepts a prospecting tool, you will call to follow up. If he expresses interests at that point, it may make sense to arrange a face-to-face -face visit. If you already know where he works, you can suggest a meeting location near his place of work, see Follow Up or Fall Down, Chapter 17. Question 2. What do you do professionally? 
A single question can be more influential than a thousand statements. Bo Bennett Of all the questions you ask during the prospecting conversation, only the magic question is more significant than this one. Knowing the prospect's occupation is pivotal to the remainder of the conversation. Ask this question immediately after the prospect answers the first one. You don't want to sound rushed, but you don't want to hesitate either. Make it sound like you're asking this question because of how he answered the first one. There are several distinct benefits of getting an answer to this question. His favorite subject. An obvious benefit is that of encouraging Jack to talk about himself, which of course is his all-time favorite subject. Since his job is probably a significant part of his life, it makes a great subject to talk about. Justify the magic question. Another benefit of asking Jack about his occupation is that it will help to justify the magic question. This is an abstract benefit and it often operates on a subconscious level. Here's how it works, one minute Jack is talking about his occupation, the next, you ask your magic question, he may assume that you're asking because of what you just learned about his occupation. This assumption may be conscious or subconscious. Either one makes Jack more receptive to your offer. A direct connection. Curiosity was framed, falsely accused. Ignorance killed the cat. Unknown. Yet another benefit of discovering the prospect's occupation is that you may be able to establish a direct connection between the prospect's occupation and your opportunity. For example, if you or someone on your team, aka upline or downline, has the same occupation as the prospect, you might use this coincidence as a reason to offer your opportunity. An indirect connection. The final benefit of asking about the prospect's occupation is more esoteric. It may provide a basis for an indirect connection to the prospect. For example, consider this dialogue excerpt. You work around here? Prospect, yeah, a couple miles back that way. You, what do you do professionally? Prospect, I'm a travel agent. You, really? How long you been doing that? Prospect, about eight years, you, you know. I met a guy a while back who was also a professional in the travel industry. I wish F had kept his business card. Do you have one on you? Look at the bold text. When you mention meeting someone else that shares Jack's occupation, you solidify a connection with Jack. It's almost as if you said, really? I used to be a travel agent. Notice also, the indirect compliment, also a professional. We connect with and compliment the prospect all in the same breath. This is a fine example of how the principles combine to complement one another. To capitalize on this benefit, collect information on the occupations of everyone you prospect or visit with. Over time, you will develop an extensive list of occupations. The bigger your list, the easier it is to develop an indirect connection. Take care that you do not force this, sincerity is king. If occupation does not provide a genuine connection, don't fabricate one. Question 3, really? How long you been doing that? The third and final question is easy for you to ask and easy for the prospect to answer. It's also easy to underestimate its benefits. Really, really works. For the longest time, I was completely unaware of how I had incorporated the word really into my prospecting conversations. One day, I went to lunch with one of my reps and as we were leaving the restaurant, I successfully prospected a total stranger. Afterward, the other rep remarked how much he liked how I used the word really. He was especially intrigued at how it seemed to cause the prospect to open up to the rest of the conversation. Because of this observation, I began to analyze my use of the word really. In particular, I needed to know how I was saying it and why it seemed to work so well. The first thing I realized is that when I would say really, I was not asking a question, I was making a statement. As you say the word, drag it out a bit like this, re -e -l -l -y. Enunciate the first syllable with rising inflection and the second syllable with falling inflection. When you get it right, magic occurs. Here's why, the sound that comes out of your mouth is re -e -l -l -y, but what the prospect hears is, oh my goodness. I have been looking for a person who does that. The second thing I realized is that really serves as a transition phrase. 
It encourages the prospect to believe that this question is a result of how he answered the previous one. Another reason for using this particular transition phrase is that it demonstrates interest in what the prospect has to say. When you combine the correct inflection with a casual tone, you orchestrate a dialogue that is natural and spontaneous. The last thing you want is for the prospect to feel like you're interrogating him. The prospect's perspective. Originally, I would ask this question to learn where the prospect is on the timeline of his career. Here is an assumption that is relatively safe to make, the longer Jack has been in his career, the more likely he will be willing to look at something else. Conversely, it may be hard for your opportunity to compete with the enthusiasm Jack has about a new job he recently started. Keep in mind that you should not use these generalizations to prejudge his interest. Instead, use them to understand his perspective, see the secret ingredient, chapter 6. Easy does it. When someone says, that's a good question, you can be sure that it's a lot better than the answer you're going to get. Franklin P. Jones. There is another benefit of asking this particular question, it is completely non-threatening. Asking this question softens the previous one. It tells the prospect, subconsciously, of course, that the hard questions are over. This, in turn, will soften his defenses. Do not underestimate the power of this subtle concept. Trolling the conversation. The previous sections describe the benefits of asking three highly specific questions that pay the cat. There is another benefit derived from asking questions in general. The very act of asking questions will produce this other benefit no matter what the questions are. This additional benefit is not merely a fact, it's the law. Seventh law of prospecting, he who asks the questions controls the conversation. Common rules of conversation will compel the prospect to answer your questions. In fact, ignoring your questions would be downright rude. When you ask Jack a question, he has a choice to make, answer your question, or be rude. Once you develop the skill of asking strategic questions in a non-threatening manner, you will have complete control of the conversation. Remember that you are the one driving the conversation. The prospect does not know what you are going to say next. Consequently, you can talk about whatever you want to. Since you get to pick the subject, choose wisely. Once you gather the correct information, you are ready to begin transitioning to the magic question. The next chapter, Mental Judo, shows you how. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons. See you soon.